Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home, Living Better. I'm Jennifer Hollett, the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we're really excited to be joining you virtually, bringing together people from across the country and beyond in conversation. Our partner this evening is Concordia University in Montreal, located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyangé Haga Nation is recognized as custodians of the lands and waters of the Joja Gay, Montreal. Montreal, where I was born, and Toronto, where I am now and live, both have long been meeting places of Indigenous peoples, and we're honored to carry on a tradition of conversation. What I'd like to do right now is invite you to join me to take some time to reflect on the land that you're on, as well as the moment in history that we're in. Thank you so much for doing that. The Walrus started 17 years ago as an optimistic project to tell stories and foster conversation across Canada. And we do that in a range of ways from our journalism in the print publication, also online daily at thewalrus.ca, to our podcast, The Conversation Piece, to our public event series, The Walrus Talks Now, The Walrus Talks at Home. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters and our partners. So thank you all for being a part of this tonight. And one of our strongest, longest standing partnerships is with Concordia University, who has made tonight's conversation possible. On that note, to start the conversation, I'd like to welcome Concordia University's President and Vice Chancellor, Graham Carr. Hi, welcome. Props to Jennifer and the Walrus team for tonight's event. We could all sure use some help learning how to live better these days. Even without a pandemic to remind us, there are countless dimensions to improving the human condition, whether at a personal or community level. The global health emergency has created its own set of challenges, not least because it's made life much worse for so many people around the globe. Tonight, I'm very proud that two Concordia researchers are contributing to the conversation on living better by sharing ideas that tackle very different aspects of the problem. A professor of biology, Carly Zitter's work on urban biodiversity focuses on the importance of ecology and species interaction happening in the cities where most of us live. If anything, the reality that many of us can't travel because of COVID is enabling us to look more closely and soak up the natural environment in our midst, in the neighborhoods we inhabit to better understand literally and figuratively our backyards. The other Concordia researcher you'll hear from tonight is Najma Khalili Mahani, the director of the Media Health Lab at Concordia. In a context where many of us have COVID alert and other apps loaded onto our phones where telemedicine has become the new normal, Naj is looking at how different groups in society are reacting as our relationships to our screens have intensified in the past seven months. It's this kind of innovative, socially centered research that Carly and Naj do that for the past two years has helped to make Concordia the top ranked North American university younger than 50 years of age. My thanks to all four speakers tonight and to you for engaging with ideas that will benefit society. And my thanks to the Walrus for helping us all to continue to stay connected and to animate the public sphere. Enjoy the evening. Thanks, Graham. The way we live has undergone massive changes this year. And we all naturally want to make sure that we're living a better life, a healthier life, in our communities, as well as global citizens. Well, tonight we have a special group of speakers who are gonna share with us new ideas on how we engage with our urban environment, our food systems, our in our communities and, and with art during some very disruptive times. And it matters more than ever that we explore ways to reset and rethink the way that we live. Here's how it works. Each speaker has five minutes. And then once your head is full of new ideas, we will have a moderated Q&A with the speakers and you at home. 
Tonight, we'll be hearing from Assistant Professor in the Department of Biology at Concordia University and a member of Concordia's Smart, Sustainable and Resilient Communities and Cities Research Group, Carly Zeter. Chef, author and activist, Joshna Maharaj. Researcher lead for the Media Health and Gain Clinic Laboratory at Concordia's Perform Center an affiliate assistant professor in design and computation arts, psychology, electrical engineering, and computer science, Najma Khalili Mahani, and the artistic director at Why Not Theater, Ravi Jain. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you for that introduction. I am Carly Zeter. During my PhD, my office mates would leave every summer to study Yellowstone National Park, one of our few remaining large, intact temperate ecosystems. I spent my summers taking temperatures of parking lots and digging up the lawns of my urban neighbors. And five years later, there is no place I would rather study the natural world than right outside my front door. Don't get me wrong, I love our big wild spaces, but the ecosystems that most fascinate me are right here in our cities. The parks and yards and spontaneous plants along the train tracks that work to create safer, healthier cities for the four out of five Canadians who live in one. The bits and pieces of green that quietly save lives during heat waves reduce food insecurity, and boost mental health. But it's easy to let this urban nature fade into the background, to think of it as ordinary rather than extraordinary. How many Torontonians are unaware that 300 species of wild native bees buzz alongside them? How many New Yorkers rush through their city never imagining that undiscovered pathogen-fighting microbes live in the soils beneath their feet? How many of my fellow Montrealers walk by our provincial tree, the yellow birch, on Mont Royal without recognizing it, not knowing that if they were to stop and scratch and sniff a twig, it would smell just like peppermint? By leaving the city to experience nature, we've lost sight of how much there is to discover at home. Until the pandemic shrank many of our worlds and suddenly neighbors were sharing newly discovered walking paths, headlines acknowledged the saving grace of city parks during confinement. Stories of green space or lack of entered the mainstream with many realizing for the first time the systemic injustices that have shaped who has access to nearby nature. Never before had so many people been aware of this fundamental truth that I've dedicated my career to studying, that to live better in the city, nature is critical, not just nice to have, but essential for well-being. I am not grateful for the pandemic. Talk of silver linings even feels inappropriate given the nature of the cloud that we're still under. But I am grateful that our urban nature was still there for us in this time of crisis. Despite efforts to cut it down, pave it over, fill it in and manicure it away, we still have urban forests to walk through at the end of the day. Those hundreds of species of bees still buzz for now, pollinating the gardens that so many of us felt compelled to grow this summer. And I think it's time for us to be there for urban nature in return, to work for greener, more equitable future cities. I'm not suggesting we all become scientists or even activists. I have in mind a quieter movement led by all of us, all who collectively manage some of our largest opportunities for change, the yards, 
and institutional lawns and church grounds and vacant lots that make up so much of the ecological fabric of our cities. Scientists like me can calculate how much cooler or less polluted our neighborhoods would be if lined by trees or which species to plant to attract birds and bees. But we can't get to this greener future without all hands on deck, without you. So where do we start? We start by bringing urban nature to the forefront, by noticing and appreciating what's still here and growing it further. That's why when my lab does our research, we invite the community to learn alongside us. And why today, I invite all of you to take a step towards becoming an urban naturalist. Next time you're outside and you see something interesting, I want you to learn its name. I suggest you start with a tree and you dig out an old field guide or download a naturalist app on your phone. And once you've met your tree, say thanks for quietly making your life a little bit better every day. Hi, thanks for that introduction. I'm Joshna Maharaj, a chef and activist. Uh, and I'm really excited about this conversation. This is a wild moment in time. Uh, for, for so many reasons. Uh, but I want to talk about our food system because that's the thing that I'm most interested in. Uh, when we think about better living and better systems, uh, as difficult as this has been, I really do think we have an amazing opportunity in front of us to really think about how to get it right. Uh, and so first, let's back up and think about maybe what's not so right, right? What didn't work? Uh, and from my perspective, one of the things that I have really, it's been tremendous to witness has been um, the, the vulnerabilities of the industrial food system and just the vulnerabilities of our existing food system. Uh, when we all went into lockdown and we made dramatic shifts in our buying patterns and our eating patterns, uh, the ripple impact of that had somewhat disastrous impacts. Uh, and I, and, and they're not all necessary, right? A lot of it was because we hadn't actually built the system really well. It wasn't strong. We didn't have resi the resilience is really not embedded in this. Uh, and it's really time for us to rethink things. Um, so uh, examples that I'm talking about here are, I mean, because it's food, right? And we all have a vested interest in this. Uh, and there are so many crazy manifestations. So just to collect some of my thinking about this, one of the, some of the things I've witnessed have been, um, uh, spikes, obviously spikes in food insecurity as people's jobs uh, got compromised and money, uh, you know, um, disappeared from family budgets. Food insecurity was a thing. However, we need to roll out to think about the fact that food, that food insecurity in general compromises people's immunity. And that makes them more susceptible to things like a virus, uh, right? People who work a low wage, uh, who work insecure jobs, often have to put themselves in much more danger to go to work. They have to take public transit. Uh, they have to, you know, work in enclosed spaces. They live in apartments with a lot of other people. Uh, things are really, our experience of this has really shifted based on so many things like our, our, our capacity and our, and our wages and our own security. Um, from a broader perspective, uh, our national distribution networks are too few, right? And there are numerous monopolies uh, and the, the evidence of empty shelves on a, you know, empty grocery store shelves. Part of it is our sort of wild hoarding, but another part of it is the fact that the distribution couldn't necessarily catch up. Uh, and what is that all about? And if, if all 37 million of us are reliant on maybe two or three lines of distribution, that is a problem, right? That is not a resilient, strong system. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the really important things that we've seen is that the industrial food processing uh, is an unsafe work environment. The fact that we had folks in meat packing and meat processing facilities getting sick because of unsafe working conditions, not because they were eating infected food or, you know, or, or consuming or the virus somehow that way. It was because their working conditions put them at risk because of proximity. Uh, and these are things these are things that are so much beyond the plate, right? These are things that we don't always think about. Um, but it really made me think about the wood meat, made me think about the wisdom I got from the Toronto Food Policy Council so many years ago, which was uh, that essentially getting the food right will automatically get everything else right. Uh, good food policy 
automatically means good health policy, good environment policy, good jobs policy, right? If we have good food, we pay people fairly, then, then farmers are gonna get a good price. They're taking better care of the land. People are consuming more healthy, wholesome food. Health outcomes start to shift. Labor practice starts to shift. We, uh, when we have a food system that's embedded with some values, our sense of trade uh, and that kind of connections outside of our community will all shift and change. Um, and, and really this is, I mean, this is a lovely thought to me, it's very inspiring, but it's super important to remember that it's not new, right? All of our cities from like, we're talking Rome, Athens cities, were all built based primarily on food access and moving food in and out of a city very well. Uh, and it's crazy to see that once our priorities shifted and we paid less attention to food as a priority and more attention to things like making money or playing golf or whatever it is we're doing, uh, that has really reworked itself. Uh, and so I really, I really think we have a cool opportunity and, and, and a responsibility, I'd say, to this moment to recognize what's not working uh, because this is not the last time we're all gonna have to go through this, right? Let's, re let's re really think about what it means to rebuild. Uh, and in my opinion, in order to rebuild our food system for better outcomes for all of us, we first need to lift our priority about food. Right? We need to care more about it. We need to give it a higher position. We need to invest more of our time, energy, and resources into it. Uh, and once we do that, we will be able to switch our values and reassert them. Right, And then with that lens of a sort of confident new assertion of the values saying it's really important to us that we all have, we all have access to really good wholesome food. It's really important that people have good working environments to, to produce our food. Uh, all of these things will shift once we get more consciousness about our values. Uh, and that to me is super exciting, right? Uh, I, got, I found a document, I was just looking to think, uh, the, the word agri-food really floats around a lot. And, and I've been sort of dealing, you know, wrestling with that, trying to understand it because agri-food seems to be the only way we have a conversation about food in this country at the federal level. Uh, and basically agri-food is uh, food production via agriculture. It's about just growing our food. Uh, but when we see, I, I found a, a report called Canada's, uh, Canada's Agri-Food Movement, right? And it's this big glorious image of a crop duster, right? It's sort of terrifying to see. Uh, but it's a report from the Minister of Finance. Um, and this is really the only federal publication that we have that talks about our domestic food production. Uh, and the thing that's most alarming to me is that there's no mention at all in it about food security or prioritizing Canadian food chains. Uh, and, and this to me is a great example of the fact that really different values, right? There are no food security values behind the way we understand a conversation about our food at the federal level, which to me just feels crazy. Uh, we, these are things that really, really need to change. Uh, and what would our agriculture, agri-food policy look like if we in fact embedded values into the strategy? Right? If we had values that said that everybody in this city uh, has, you know, has fair and good, easy access to wholesome food, how would the way we use restaurants change? How would the way we, you know, will we have a, a plan to repurpose kitchens when things like a pandemic hit and we all have to go into lockdown? There are so many opportunities. Uh, and, and I think that the, the disconnection from food that is resulting in a lot of pain and poverty and, and suffering for people uh, is quite needless, right? We can be smarter about this. Uh, and I think this is the moment for us to really pay attention uh, and act and be brave enough, right? To make some new decisions. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Najma Khalili Mahani. It's a long name. You may call me Naj. And I study um, screens and stress. Since 20 years ago, when I graduated as an electrical engineer and when cellular phones had entered our lives, I've been asking, are these technologies positive extensions of us or are they harmful to our body and mind? My background is in stress neuroscience and I'm also a biomedical engineer. Biomedical engineers make tools to extend the bodies that need them. And I design information and uh, communication technologies that promote emotional health and social well being of those who suffer uh, chronic pain and stress. Successful designers and innovators um, aspire to create indispensable technologies that extend our senses, our sense of control. And this is why revolutionary technologies such as the internet, um, cell phones, social networks, or things like artificial intelligence that are entering our lives can become addictive. 
But is this addiction good or bad? Of course, these are not new questions. In 1960s, Marshall McLuhan um, urged us to understand any new media as physicians uh, would go about understanding stressed and, and diseased bodies. New media technologies extend our body, they touch our eyes, our ears, and are also uh, our nervous system. McLuhan uh, drew attention to the medical research of Hans Selyer, the father of stress uh, science um, in, the, in the 60s. And of course, that is where the field of neuroscience was born. Selyer had shown that any local injury or psychological threat would trigger a generalized stress response um, in the entire body. We now know the hormone for stress is called cortisol. McLuhan argued that new media amputated and replaced existing organs for communication with faster and more powerful machines. Now, when you replace an organ, um, the site of the transplant would become initially numb, but every transplant is a physical and psychological stressor. It causes discomfort and inflammation everywhere until the body gets used to it or dies from it. Now today, um, like you, I have been grappling with this Zoom transplant. Of course, it's opening my home to you. You're welcome. Uh, but our bodies are confined to these, to these screens and it's not a comfortable uh, interaction. So are these new screen realities stressful to our bodies or is there a silver lining? Last year, we asked uh, 650 adults to characterize the link between their screen addiction and uh, their stress. Interestingly, those who depended on their screens for socialization, entertainment, and relaxation were more likely to call themselves addicted to screens. In contrast, those who were dependent on their screens, and even more so for work or information, did not call themselves screen addicted. Now, behavioral addiction is bad because it skews our motivation. It moves us away from goals or norms that keep us physically and socially um, healthy. We become uh, concerned about these when behavioral addictions create obsessive habits that risk our personal uh, or socioeconomic well-being. But if we are worried about health, then should we be concerned about addiction to screens for work or information too? And what if addiction to screens for entertainment or social networking or games help us cope with stress? Isn't coping with anxiety and depression while playing a computer game safer than depending on psychoactive drugs? And what if being glued to a screen for work or school is going to be hurting our bodies? Right now, we really don't know, but we should find out. In April 2020, we had an unprecedented opportunity to ask a simple question in a short survey. Does COVID-19 stress increase our screen dependency? Not surprising, dependence on teleconferencing was up by almost 80%, and now 1,000 um, participants and respondents have taken this, this survey. But the majority of respondents picked streaming services such as Netflix as a primary coping tool in their survival kit. Similar to previous survey uh, that we did, those who experienced higher stress were also more dependent on social networks and passive media for entertainment. Social media mattered for providing connections and community. Games and movies mattered for distraction. Many of the high stress respondents in this survey were wary of false and sensational news, but they avoided or ignored it. Now, how do our bodies adapt and adjust to these new electronic transplants? Before the pandemic, we were awakening from the numbness of our screen addiction. Uh, but now we need them to earn a living, to get educated and to be connected like we are right now. They are the anesthetics that get us through COVID-19 stress as well. Going back to the laws of media proposed by McLuhan, um, Marshall and Eric McLuhan, they suggested that when uh, confronted with a new media technology, we must ask four questions. One, what are they extending? What are they killing? and what are they reviving? And most importantly, what is going to happen when pushed to, this, to the extreme? And probably the question that we should be asking ourselves in this a new screen dependent age of COVID is what that extreme is going to be. Thank you for your attention.
Hi, uh, my name is Ravi Jain. I'm the artistic director of Why Not Theater. So Why Not Theater, we are more than just a theater company. Our work is about city building and activating civic engagement through the arts. So we wanna use the arts to make meaningful change for the people who live in cities. And we do that in three ways. We make and tour uh, new work and that work challenges the status quo of what stories are told and who gets to tell them. The second thing we do is we share our resources to support other artists, uh, artists who are uh, uh, not in the mainstream marginalized artists and we share our resources to help them tell their stories and tour their work. And the third thing we do is we provoke change by removing barriers of access to participation in the arts for both artists and audiences. And that's all about systems change. And I'll talk about one of those systems change today. Um, so we're a unique company in that we've grown significantly in the last four years. We are uh, have an operating budget of $2 million and a full-time team of 10 people. And that is super rare because we don't have a building. And so everyone, as we were growing, said, you got to get a space, go become a new institution, buy a space. And really quickly, we looked at the model and we said, you know, the business model of running a space in a city like Toronto is terrible. Plus the needs for artists to use space, the need is so great. And the capacity of just one building is reached so quickly that you're not really serving the needs of a community and not having a venue lets us be flexible. We can be anywhere and everywhere all the time. And worse, the resources that you need to, to build a space is so huge. So if I raise $6 million to build a theater, well, actually it'd be better spent to give it to the community. We could change the system if we got money in the actual hands of people. So we started asking ourselves questions by saying, you know, there's so much space in the city that isn't used. So what could we do with it if we could get it? What if we could build a new institution? And so we had a vision to say, what if we said, all of Toronto was our theater, all of the empty spaces that existed. What if we thought of that as our theater? How could we get access to it and turn those place, those spaces into uh, artistic spaces? So then the dream became, what if we could make space free for all artists? What kinds of artists would that enable? What kinds of audiences would that eventually bring to the theater? And what could it mean for making a more vibrant city where art plays a key role in the lives of everyday people? So we ran a pilot at the end of last fall where we set out and we um, activated empty spaces in downtown and turned them into temporary rehearsal halls at no cost to artists. So what we did is we partnered with uh, Crest Point, which is a investment property developer, the United Churches and a Portuguese community center called Casa do Alentejo uh, in Little Portugal in Toronto. And with Crest Point, it was really unique because all of the spaces they provided were in the downtown core. They were offices and commercial buildings. So we got to put arts closer to where people are, right? Like the arts usually happens externalized from where people are, we're, we're on the fringes or we're at that theater that's far away from, you don't even know where it is probably. So we're getting to be right where people are and potentially changing the people's relationship to the arts because it's where you are. So we acted as a broker between those spaces and the artists. We figured out the insurance, the contracting, the cleaning, security, accountability, all of those things. And it was incredible. So we gave away space to about 50 artists and that's about 2,500 hours of space that was given away. And in giving it away for free, all of the artists increased their own fees by 63%. So they got to pay themselves better. Artists are among the working poor, especially BIPOC artists, which we'll get to, the working poor. So here's an opportunity to activate the space and actually pay themselves better. And we ran the space pilot at $9,000 was the running of the cost. So all in, we were able to run the program at $3.50 an hour. $3.50 $3 an hour was the rate if you look at it that way. So like I said, the outcomes, um, we activated these empty spaces. Nobody was using them. Um, the artists got to pay themselves better, so providing economic support. And then BIPOC artists, you know, we had a, obviously uh, a, a, a desire to support those folks who we work with the most. And um, providing access, providing that resource just allows them to actually develop skills, earn money, and actually make better art. So successful pilot ran, awesome. Then COVID, in the middle of our phase two of the pilot. And COVID revealed uh, a whole new way of looking at this. Uh, problem of space. So COVID revealed some challenges for the arts, uh, made them very pressing, even though people had known this for a while, it really revealed the economic pre precarity of most artists. 
working poor, very hard to sustain a living as an artist and often you're subsidizing your own career through your pockets. Then there was the racial reckoning that emerged uh, in the time of COVID. So obviously exposing the systemic barriers for artists of color, black artists, indigenous artists, and the, the divide uh, of, of being able to practice your art. And then it emphasizes the relationship and cost of space. And like in Montreal, like in Toronto, Vancouver, major cities, it's getting increasingly, 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 increasingly expensive to live here and work here. So that's exposed the problems of the arts. For real life, <laughs> real life people, we're all real life people. But for Main Street, let's say, COVID exposed uh, the problem of now more and more offices and commercial spaces are becoming empty. And also, you know, people are dealing with the physical and mental impacts of COVID and the PTSD of it is gonna be a long-term effect. So when we think about that, um, how can we, for us, we started saying, how can we think of a way where artists can play a role in the recovery of, of a COVID relief strategy for a city? How can we take the challenges that the art sector is facing and the challenges that Main Street are facing and collide them to find a better solution? So one example in this space idea is artists have a ton of transferable skills. And so if we could provide free space to those artists to, for example, teach a yoga class, run an after school kids program in the arts, obviously COVID uh, uh, safety precautions need to be considered, but then those main street people can pay a fee to that artist, help generate income for that artist and get a service like a yoga class or, you know, taking care of your kids for two hours. Oh my God, on Zoom, we all know the stresses of that. So providing a service for Main Street to help through the recovery, activate these empty spaces, because we all know these empty spaces, it's not good for a city. It's not good for the energy, the vibrancy of a city. So here's just one example of a way where we can integrate the arts, activate spaces and provide services for everyday people. And we're working with the Canadian Urban Institute uh, to figure out ways to incentivize business owners, property developers, property managers through, for example, a tax abatement. If a property developer has a space in the meanwhile time when it's not being used, could the city provide them a tax abatement if it's provided to artists at, free, at no cost? And then again, providing services for people. And we have this cycle where arts is actually playing a role in the recovery of COVID. Now, the majority of support for the arts and the relationship to arts in a city is through buildings. It's institutions, and it's true that we need them, they're important, but we also need to build and support an infrastructure that's about people, not just buildings. And our vision is to open up spaces as a way of investing in people who can actually activate communities, artists, we know that they do that. And opening up the barrier of space to those artists, we believe can unlock incredible potential for us as a city and for the people who live in it. So if we can make more access to spaces, we can maximize the existing resources that we have to imagine a new and healthier way of looking at how everyday spaces can transform into artistic lifelines, providing a necessary economic and mental health support to create vibrant cities. Thank you so much, Ravi, Najma, Joshna, and Carly. And also a shout out to our audience. We have audience members registered from all over tonight, Halifax, Dorval, Quebec, Guelph, Ontario, Regina, Victoria, and beyond. We also have many Concordia alumni here tonight, including me, I'm a journalism and communications grad. And I know some of my uh, classmates from my year are joining us as well. All right, it's now time for the Q&A session. If you have a question, you can ask it in the Zoom chat box. And to those who already submitted a question, we see them coming in. And our speakers are gonna join us. I have some questions to kick us off. Uh, this, is a, this is the great thing about having a journalism and communications degree is uh, I get to put it to use. I'd love to start with you, Carly. I definitely have been spending more time walking and exploring my city in, in COVID to stay well. Uh, but I still think of nature as the forest or farmland. So why are we so disconnected from even this idea of urban nature? Like, I, I just think in, until you said it, I, I don't even really appreciate 
the nature or call it even when it is around me? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I think I think that's it's not just you. That's very true of, of many of us. I mean, even myself, sometimes I find myself thinking like, oh, I'd be really great to get out into nature this weekend. And like, this is what I do. Um, and I think it's because this is the perception we've always been been taught, right? This is in popular culture. This is in movies. This is in advertising that nature is like out there, that wilderness is out there and you absorb those messages. And I think we need we need to do a little bit of reprogramming to start to, to bring that urban nature to the foreground and to show people that these really fascinating interactions you know, between species happen right here at home, happen in our yards. Uh, it needs to be brought into the education system. And just to finish that thought, I mean, it's not, it's not a replacement, right? We shouldn't only have urban nature. We need the big nature too. It's not an either or, it's a, it's a both and. I love that idea of the big nature. <laughs> uh, <laughs> big nature and small nature, that's exactly. how I think about it. <laughs> All sizes. Uh, Joshna, you, you know, you said in your talk, we have to lift our priority of food. And in a way that sounds easy because we all need food and love food, uh, but but clearly there's something broken. So so what is it that's that's keeping the priority down? I mean, I, I have your book here, Take Back the Tray. It's like, who took it from us? <laughs> That's a great question. I love that. Um, and uh, the, there is what's happening in our public institutions is a reflection of our general priorities, right? It's not an isolated thing. This is in all aspects of our lives. This, this low priority of food exists. And we can point fingers in a number of directions. Uh, governments who make, you know, slashy Bernie budget cuts and sort of force the hands uh, of people. But then there's like the, the food, the big agri-food business machine that sort of met the needs of cash-strapped administrators and said, look at all of this really cheap, uh, awesome food we can make for you. Uh, right. And so like everyone sort of plays on each other um, and we get too distracted with uh, buying phones and shoes and you know what I mean? And other things, uh, right. The, the iPod and smartphone budget had to come from somewhere. Uh, and it's, it feels very clear that the food budget, right. Which is your first flexible, expendable budget line. Cause you have to pay, you can't pay half your rent. You got to pay all your rent. Uh, so food is the first budget line that you can start playing with. Um, and then because you can buy, really cheap things, uh, we start our, our sense of what we should pay for our food really gets distorted. Um, so so a, a number of people have taken this, you know what I mean? It's sort of really fragmented. And one of the things that that signals to me is the fact that we need some, some sort of codified leadership and values about our food in a way that actually protects our food so that this kind of vulnerability doesn't exist as we move forward, right? Our food needs more protection, just like our land and our air and our space. You know, it's all of that in a, in a broader continuum. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Naj, I, I have to say, I'm, I, I'm tickled by your area of expertise because I think we're all staring at screens all day and, and all night, here we are right now. Uh, but I, I think about the evolution of, of screen addiction. When I was growing up, it was TV everyone was concerned about. And then it, it moved specifically to video games. And then it was the phones and, and the tablets and the apps. And, and now it's, it's Zoom or video chat. Uh, like how has that, evolved it, you know will it be something else next i think i think with every new technology there is this wave of um, resistance right when uh, gutenberg uh, popularized print a lot of people were afraid of what he was doing uh, you know to both to the ability to learn things but also to the morality of the, of the people and i think we've been grappling with these technologies of communications Right now, we are really forced to be in front of these these um, these screens. They are. I don't think they are optimal. I think all of us have a sense of discomfort, but but I think with every technology, there is a double edge, right? If we didn't have this, we wouldn't be here together. I would not have had the opportunity to share my ideas with four hundred people. Um, it would have been windy, probably, if I had to go to one of these lectures, I would have found an excuse to not go. So I think it's a question of moderation, but, but I want to sort of 
um, also acknowledge that the reality that I think all of us um, ultimately depend on is the food and is the nature in which we exist. Uh, we, we, we live on food and we might be able to entertain and educate um, and sort of relieve some of the um, psychological pain of, of the life that we are living during this COVID, but, but ultimately uh, nature is going to be a refuge. Um, so so that's, that's something to constantly keep in mind while we are sitting in front of these screens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this whole time definitely makes us rethink and re-examine everything. And, and, and Ravi, we want to bring you in because like space, right? Like we have such a different relationship with space right now. So this idea of the city being a, a theater like is all space equal or like what makes a good artistic space? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think that um, a, a different artists need different spaces. So a visual artist, a, uh, like a painter or a musician or a dancer or a theater person might need a different space uh, for based on their needs. And I think, I think the thing for me is we know that artists uh, play a role in increasing the value of, of communities and spaces you know, through gentrification. And so what is a way that we can think about, uh, and gentrification benefits everybody but the artists or every you know, property primarily. And so how can we think about um, the role that artists can play by benefiting from space? And, and what happens, or what is the potential of what could happen from encounters in those spaces with kind of general public. I think that's the thing I'm really thinking about is um, how, do we, how do we create the opportunity for artists to identify the kinds of spaces they can use? Because there's such a variety of space that exists out there. So how can we create the mechanism for, uh, just to create those access points and create the openness so that people can access and identify the spaces that are best suited for them? That's great. Okay, we have a lot of audience questions coming in. Um, uh, this one is from Vicky for Carly. Uh, Carly, could you suggest to our audience a naturalist app that you think is best for non-biologists? Sure, yes. Um, there are so many out there, and so it depends a little bit what you want to look at, but a really good general one is called iNaturalist. If you Google iNaturalist, you'll, you'll find it. Um, and that will help you identify pretty much anything you want. You can also contribute to, to citizen or community science projects with your observations, which is very cool. So definitely connecting screens and you know how we can contribute in, in different ways. Our next question is for, from Laura, it's for Doshna. Uh, Laura asks, how does your book help solve the problems you, you mentioned with the current food landscape? Mm, great question, thank you for that. Uh, I, I hope and I think that the book is a really good argument for why we should care about food and why it's worth rethinking our sort of messed up priorities around food. And then it is some really tangible marching orders based on my experience on the ground in institutions trying to make this change. Uh, and so there's things that I have done that do not need to be done again, right? They were very complicated and arduous and there's some objective lessons. And so in the book, I've really used my experience and that connection uh, to try and offer people a bit of a blueprint. I say it's like, here's steps A through C on working this revolution. Do this, because I, I have a sense that it'll be pretty similar uh, wherever you go. And then you can figure out what D through Z is gonna look like in your community and in your space. Uh, but this is really, I was just actually looking through the book last night thinking, if I've done anything, it's I've made a really good argument for why we should care and the amazing, really positive ripple of impact that can result from a shift in our values and, and therefore a shift in our thinking. And ultimately, I think that's the core of all your talks, right? Is, is like caring about the world around us, but specifically at this time where there is an opportunity to do things differently coming out of COVID. That's it. People are listening and are ready to hear it more than they ever have before. And so I, we would be foolish not to take the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. All right, more questions. Uh, we'll get to these. Uh, this is from Mary for Ravi, uh, who asked, could any of these empty spaces also be used for the homeless? Uh, have, have you discovered anything about that in, in, in your work, in your research? 
Uh, I haven't uh, gotten that far in the, we, we got stopped by COVID, but again, I think it's really about, um, I really love this idea, especially, and Joshua has been bringing it up a lot of values and like, how, how do we think about space as a city? I think that's the thing is how do we open up the gates and think about doing things differently based on a different set of values. And so, um, you know, yes, yes to homeless people using the spaces, yes to musicians, yes to all kinds of people. How can we rethink spaces? And, and as Joshna said, like also restaurants, like repurposing kitchens, you know, how can we think about what, what are the um, mutually beneficial outcomes that can result from different ways of thinking about how we use space? That's fundamentally, uh, I think the opportunity now and when, we, when, when people are listening, when we are rethinking values and, when we're in a moment when we, we've seen that we can, we can move things really quickly, like the Canadian government moved so fast in its response to COVID. They activated immediately. They threw a lot of money at the, at the, to solve a lot of problems. And they also, more importantly, they were iterative in the processes of how they tried to figure things out, which is like not how government works. And if they can do it, well, then we absolutely can. I mean, that is, that is, the power of people, as long as we're able to get together and, and iterate process and figure out how we're going on, we just need the access and the resource to be able to take the time to figure it out. Great, thank you. All right, we have a, a question for Naj. This is from Maureen. Senior Calgarian here, Maureen writes, I've become a bit of a webinar junkie since COVID hit. We thank you for that. And I've signed up for as many as three a day. I love these opportunities for lifelong learning. Do you see this as healthy or unhealthy? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, there is a part of me that is organizing these kind of webinars and these kind of activities, uh, especially for um, the more senior um, individuals in the society who are vulnerable to this virus and, uh, and probably should have avoid uh, as much as possible socialization. Um, I, think, I think these kind of interactions, if they are learning and if they're enhancing your well-being, of course, they are not going to be um, stressful. Um, there is a comment from Elaine that I want to sort of um, answer that because it's, it's related. Uh, the content with which we are communicating, the content that we are consuming is, is uh, determining to a great extent whether these are beneficial or not. But the reality is that there is a physical interaction between us and these digital devices. It definitely is going to have an impact on our body if you are sitting in front of the screens and our, on our eyes if you are constantly staring at them. So to keeping a balance between the screen and then taking a walk in the nature, I think uh, uh, that would be that would be the best uh, the best way of finding a balance. Yeah, and I think that's what we're all looking for from our cities, right? In in any time. Is, is, is very much that, that balance. Uh, all right, our next question. This is for Carly, it's from Erica. Do you think a vegetable garden or a pollinator garden in an urban front yard would have more ability to sequester carbon and clean air in a city? So that's a great question. And that's one of the things that, you know, that I'm really focused on in, in my work and many others are, is what are the the co-benefits or the multiple benefits we get by greening our cities. And we know that there are many. So for example, you know, if you plant a tree, if you plant a vegetable garden, you're not just doing one thing. You're not just providing shade or providing space for fall pollinators or food. You're providing many things at once, you know, cleaner air, cleaner water, more carbon sequestration. And so, yes, the, the sh very short answer to your question is, Yes, transforming your yard can do that. And I noticed there, there were a couple more comments that have been kind of flying by here on what do we do? You know, what do I plant in my yard? What do I do? How do I help? Um, and the great news is if you have a yard, you can help. Uh, we think of green space and nature as being like parks and, and bigger public spaces, but most of our green space in most cities is privately owned. It's 60% of the trees in Toronto are on private land. You know, this is, this is up to all of us. And one great thing you can do is take some of that land and take it out of grass and do something else. Plant some native plants, plant a vegetable garden. So this is where I'm thinking, you know, Josh and I would love to get your thoughts on, you know, people using the, you know, the, the grass, the yard that they have and, and, and in cities like Toronto and Montreal, it's not a lot, but to 
plant vegetables, right, to, to grow food. Or even you can get a lot. I know more and more apartment and condo buildings and co-ops also have space. Definitely. The growing, uh, we the Toronto Community Garden Network, I'm not sure if they still exist as a body, but they used to do these brilliant workshops telling you how to plant things in old rubber boots and the fact that milk crates are wonderful for strawberry plants because of all the little avenues for the, for the berries to peek out. But even whatever sort of few meters by few meters of a front or backyard in an urban space can generate a lot of food. Right? Let's just even just think about food production, the amount of food that can be generated if you can wrestle it away from the squirrels and the raccoons then. <laughs> we do have uh, right? that is a, that is a whole other conversation um, because they're ter- like if, yeah, it's terrible. But uh, you can in fact generate a lot of food and if you're thoughtful about how you grow and you really push organic thinking, you know and, and don't sort of blanket with um, pesticide spray and that sort of thing, you really can, right And and I think what, what we're hearing, I'm hearing from all of my fellow panelists is this moment really has opportunities for individual action, right? This is not a like, we have to go and start run to Ottawa and lobby the because that's the only way to get something done. It's not, it really is. Find out how to repurpose your own space. Think about what's happening in your own house, in your own community with your own habits, uh, right? And I like to say all the time with food, the glorious thing about it is that if you get your head straight about it, it is a win, 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 win situation, right? The land gets better taken care of. We get really good food. The environment gets cleaned up a little bit. Communities get a bit stronger because they realize that this guy grows really great zucchinis, but this person makes really great tomatoes and then they swap, right? And that becomes an annual habit, right? And then while they're doing that, uh, they're gonna have a meal. And then while they're gonna have a meal, someone's gonna play some music. Like it just will grow that beautifully, right? At least, I mean, look, my life and my work experience is testament to all of this. I'm sure Ravi would say the same thing. Well, yeah, and, and Ravi, you know, you were speaking about artists, but ultimately for, for artists, it's to bring people together, right? It, it comes back to the audiences. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, audiences because you, in your talk, mentioned BIPOC artists. So for BIPOC artists, I want to know about the connection and how that's shaping audiences. And are we seeing greater diversity in the audiences who are connecting with art? Well, that's the funny thing is right now we can't access audiences. And so a big thing for what we've been, what we at Why Not Theatre have been focusing on primarily is, okay, we can't work with audiences right now. So how do we work with artists and support artists to provide them the opportunities to get stronger now uh, so that when we come back, we're stronger and ready and, and more prepared to take on and, and just be, uh, yeah, have changed the, the how of how the theater is made because we know, or the arts are, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of barriers to black, indigenous and people of color artists. Uh, I mean, this is now, become apparent now for everyone, I hope. Um, and so through mentorship programs, and then again, the, the biggest resource, the biggest asset we need to make work is space. So if we can prioritize black, indigenous and people of color to be able artists, to be able to use that space and activate that space, it's like, it's like training at the gym. You just get stronger, you get better at what you do. And then the hope is when you come back and are presenting work, then the audiences can change and, and your voice will be uh, 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 be able to resonate with a wider base of audience and hopefully audiences come because they'll see themselves reflected in you. So in this time, let's do the work to make the changes, the harder change, which is let's change the process. And then when we come back, the results can be different. Nobody wants to change process. That's, that's where, that's what we have to use this time to do. And, and where I think a lot of people are talking about is you know, reconnecting to food, reconnecting to nature, reconnecting to a mental health and a spirit, all these things that our busy lives took us away from. And so how are we really gonna invest in the spiritual kind of examination, the values-based combination, com- examination so that we are changed and we're better when we come back? Yeah, thank you, Ravi and Brian and Fabi right in chat. A soundtrack for change. Uh, both the random music, but also all of your talks. Uh, On that note, we are out of time for questions, but thank you to everyone who submitted questions. It's been a very engaging evening. Thank you again to Carly Zeter, Joshua Maharaj, Najma Khalili Mahani, and Ravi Jain. And if you enjoyed tonight's event, we have more coming up. The Walrus Talks at Home at the Broadbent Institute's 2020 Progress Gala takes place this Thursday. 
singer songwriter Jan Arden will be at that one. And then next Thursday, November 26, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation presents the Walrus Talks Housing. You can check in at the walrus.ca slash events to browse our schedule and register for any event that you're interested in. And you can also watch uh, videos from our previous events in the Walrus Talks video room on our website. And we'll have uh, videos from this uh, talk up there as well. Do keep an eye on your inbox. You're going to receive a follow-up email. And if you'd like to attend future events like this one and stay in touch with us at The Walrus, please sign up to the newsletter in that email. The Walrus is a registered nonprofit and our award-winning journalism events like this, our podcast, we do that with the support of our community of donors and sponsors. So if you enjoy tonight's free event, please donate by visiting thewalrus.ca slash donate. And if you make a donation before the end of the year, it will be matched dollar for dollar up to $100,000 by two generous Canadians, Diane Blake and Stephen Smith, who like you believe that a healthy society is an informed one. A few thank yous. Thank you to Graham Carr, Carr, Carr Joanne Pelletier, Philippe Beauregard, Charmian Harvey, and everyone at Concordia for making tonight's conversation possible. Thank you as well to our annual sponsors, Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada, and Shaw. And uh, as we've discussed tonight, coming together in community is really important in these COVID times, and each one of you is part of the Walrus. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great night, everyone.